The Boy on Fairfield Street. How Ted Geisel grew up to become Dr. Seuss. Once upon a time, there lived a boy who feasted on books and was wild about animals. He was born in 1904 and lived in the best of all possible places, 74 Fairfield Street in Springfield, Massachusetts. The gray three-story house was exactly three blocks from the public library, and it was just six blocks from the zoo. This boy loved lots of things besides reading and animals, sledding, doodling, trying on costumes, singing around the piano with his family, exploring the green fields of nearby Forest Park. All in all, he excelled at fooling around. No one on Fairfield Street could have said how Ted Geisel, that funny boy, would turn out. No one in the world could have, especially Ted. At dinner, Ted's family gathered around the huge oak table. Often they talked about the animals in the zoo. Ted's father, Theodore Geisel, worked in the family business, but he also helped out at the zoo and eventually was superintendent of parks, which meant he actually ran the zoo. Ted would eat baked beans and bratwurst and thrilled to stories of stubborn bears and chattering monkeys, prowling lions and wild wolves. At night, their hoots and cries sometimes found their way into his dreams. So I can tell already that Ted has a lot of experiences and he seems to have a lot of imagination. Ted's mother, Henrietta Seuss Geisel, helped him find books at the library. Her dream was to get Ted and his sister, Marnie, into college as the first in their family to go. Perhaps Ted might even grow up to become Dr. Geisel. Each night, she lulled them to sleep with stories and nonsense verse, like the names of pies, apple, mince, lemon, peach, apricot, pineapple, blueberry, coconut, custard, and squash. Ted would listen, curled up with a gift from her, his first stuffed animal, a plump dog he had named Theophrastus. So this page tells us all about Ted's family members and their relationships. And it looks like they have a pretty nice relationship. Ted celebrated his birthdays with noisy parties of dozens of neighborhood children wearing funny costumes and hats. In the winter, he built tunnels in the snow in the backyard and went sledding and ice skating in Forest Park. When spring arrived, he marched his toy soldiers around on the front porch with his three-legged bulldog, Rex, for company. He and his best friend, Bill, would roam the neighborhood. Neighbors were always interesting to him. A family named the Bumps, a dentist who treated patients in his own home, two women who didn't mind when Ted practiced his bugle, they were hard of hearing, the nosy man across the street, he ran the local paper, the Springfield Union. Ted and Bill and the other Fairfield Street boys invented ways to test each other, like chin-up or ear-wiggling contests. All year round, they explored Forest Park with its lily ponds, trout streams, bike paths, and tennis courts. Now, something I'm noticing is there's a little illustration on the bottom of each page where the words are. And across from that, there's always what looks like a real illustration from his life. And I'm gonna start showing you these up close because some of them might look familiar. During summers, at a beach cottage, Ted went fishing with his father, built sand castles, learned to swim, dug in the sand for clams. The family sang or told stories at night, 
usually outside where Ted could count fireflies and stars. Parades around Springfield were happy days. There was so much to take in, circus acrobats, flashy marching bands with trumpets blasting and drums pulsing, and people twirling by on bicycles of all kinds. Ted didn't, Ted did begin noticing ways he didn't really fit in around Springfield. He spoke German as well as English. His grandparents were German immigrants and the Geisels were always the outsiders compared with families that had lived there for generations. Even events in Europe were ca causing anger at German Americans here. Thoughtless children at school teased Ted for having a German name, singing German songs, eating German food, and whatever else they could think of, even having a dog with three legs. Sometimes they chased him or beat him up. It was on the playground that Ted developed his strong awareness of injustice. On top of all that, the Geisel family business was a brewery. Plenty of Springfield citizens frowned on people who drank beer. Nor did Ted always fit in at home. Both his parents were skilled at rifle shooting and won trophies for it. Every morning, his father practiced shooting holes in paper targets for half an hour. He was always urging Ted to take up target shooting or some competitive sport. But Ted was bored by shooting and he avoided athletics whenever he could. Gym teachers sighed at his lack of muscles. So this page is all about how Ted didn't fit in with other kids for various reasons. And check out these guys. Hopefully they look familiar. Anybody know who they are? They're the Sneetches. Think about the message that was in that book, The Sneetches, about how some Sneetches were the good Sneetches and others were not. Hmm. I may be seeing some of the reasons where Ted got his inspiration. Certainly no one knew he seemed to like drawing as much as he did. Sometimes he even drew on his bedroom walls with his crayons. Everyone was horrified except for his mother. He drew the animals he saw in his father's zoo. <clears throat> he drew his imaginary creatures. He drew whatever popped into his head. Like his friends, he adored Crazy Cat and other comic strips. Ted would run up to the corner each night to greet his father, then grab the comics page from his father's newspaper. One day, when Ted was 12 and doodling as usual, he found himself sketching a funny little cartoon of a man reeling in a giant fish. His parents helped him enter the drawing in a contest run by the Springfield Union. Ted won first prize. But when he tried taking an art class in high school, the only one he ever took, his teacher scolded him for breaking rules. She thought he was fooling around. The day she warned him he would never be successful at art, he quit the class. Ted did break rules. He started to notice when rules didn't make sense and he always knew his art broke, he already knew his art broke the rules. <clears throat> his biggest crime was exaggerating things. The creatures he drew had ears nine feet long. His horses had wings. His cows could fly as well. His animals looked like plants. His plants looked like animals. He just had this unusual way of looking at the world, and more often than not, this seemed like a bad thing to other people. Ted turned 13 in the year 1917, a year that the United States declared war on Germany and entered World War I. Luckily, no one could question his patriotism. He was a proud Boy Scout selling United States Liberty Bonds to support the war effort. Walking door to door around Springfield, he collected so much money that he became one of the top 10 bond selling scouts in town. Now he was going to receive an award. Ted stood on a platform in front of City Hall, 
grinning at his family and the thousands of Springfieldians who turned out that sunny morning. Ex-President Theodore Roosevelt stirred up the crowd with a speech, then walked down the line of scouts, handing out medals and congratulating each one. Ted stood up straight. But when the former president came to him, Roosevelt blurted, what's this little boy doing here? It seemed Roosevelt only had nine medals and Ted was the 10th scout in line. No one knew what to do. After a painful silence, Ted was guided off stage. His usual instinct was to be awkward in public. And after that, he tried to avoid being in public at all. Hmm, that's kind of sad for him. Ted's parents soon learned he was never going to be studious like his sister Marnie. In class, he doodled instead of taking notes. Sometimes he skipped class altogether to go to the movies. Even his mother frowned at him then, warning that people who went to the movies in the daytime ended up as failures, not doctors. In high school, he played the banjo, wrote stories, and drew cartoons from the school for the school paper and got his classmates to laugh. They voted him class artist and class wit. Ted did have one teacher who encouraged him, his favorite English teacher. He urged Ted to apply to his old school, Dartmouth College in nearby New Hampshire. Many around Springfield were astonished when Ted did make it to Dar Dartmouth, fulfilling his mother's dream. In college, everyone admired his talent for silliness. He was clearly gifted, though no one knew exactly at what. It wasn't as if men can doodle for a living. His best times were writing verse and drawing for the Jack-O-Lantern, the college humor magazine. But after one too many parties with his fraternity brothers, the college forced him to resign as the Jack-O-Lantern's editor. Ted got around this punishment by writing for the magazine under another name. Partly for his own amusement, he had been experimenting with signing different names to his work. It was at Dartmouth when he started using Seuss, his mother's maiden name and his own middle name. Classmates on their way to becoming doctors and lawyers and bankers voted Ted Geisel least likely to succeed. Usually you wanna get voted most likely to succeed. After college, he was plagued with more doubts than ever. He had no money, no job prospects. He did have a place to go. He could always move back into his parents' house in Springfield, but wouldn't this be a step backward? Was he forever to be the boy on Fairfield Street? Stalling for time, he applied for a prestigious grant to study English literature at Oxford University in England and led his parents to believe he was getting it. Unfortunately, someone else got the grant, but Ted's father had already bragged to the editor at the Springfield Union, which published the big news. To save face, Ted's father came up with the money to send his son, the exaggerator, to Oxford anyway. Oxford University is a prestigious or important and hard to get into school in England. Now Ted was supposed to be doing serious work, studying early Anglo-Saxon poetry and the plays of William Shakespeare. Instead, he was off doodling and scrawling little poems as usual. One day, a classmate he had a crush on looked over his shoulder. She whispered for his ears alone, that's a very good flying cow. Oddly enough, this one remark suddenly put the world into focus for Ted. This was him, a guy who loved to draw animals and loved to write verse. With more encouragement from his classmate, Ted decided to leave school. I don't think his parents are gonna be very happy about this. 
He moved back to Fairfield Street for the time being. All of his energy would now go into ways, finding ways to make money doing what he loved, not what others might want him to do. Ted began flooding the mailrooms of New York magazines and newspapers with funny articles and animal drawings. Hundreds of them, an entire zoo of crazy birds and beasts. Then one morning in July, the postman rang the bell at 74 Fairfield Street with an acceptance letter. The Saturday Evening Post, a major magazine, offered him $25 for a cartoon of two American tourists riding camels. Ted let out a hoot and ran upstairs to tell his parents, with a little exaggeration, that the Post was going to publish all of his drawings from now on. Instead, other magazines started wanting his drawings of creatures, and it all began to seem like a dream. Ted's response? He sent out more drawings than ever. Fantastical beasts, imaginary settings. He took to signing his latest work, Dr. Theophrastus Seuss, or just Dr. Seuss. The name tickled him. It had that doctor ring to it and he and his, that he and his family liked so much. Plus, he could save Ted Geisel, his real name, for the great works that he would dash off in some vague future. Vague means unknown. And this guy might look familiar to you. At first, people around the country who saw these new cartoons by Dr. Seuss wrote letters of complaint. A prisoner on death row said he didn't mind dying if Ted's work was the best that publishers could do. But he also got fan mail. Some people seemed to really appreciate his work. In fact, one day he even received a request for his autograph from a 12-year-old boy. Ted glowed for days. This letter pleased him to no end. Not so much the autograph part. It was that a young person had asked for it. Was it possible that his work could be good for children? The boys and girls now growing up on Fairfield Street? Now that sounded interesting. It meant he could share his own love of reading, animals, and justice. He could even promote fooling around. By the time August arrived, Ted was packing his suitcases. It was time to say farewell to his parents and take a train to the big city, New York to find his own place to live. He found it, a tiny apartment in Greenwich Village. And that Monday, Ted Geisel got busy at his old wooden drawing board. He had his colored pencils, his paints, his typewriters, many eraser, and his little furry stuffed dog, Theophrastus. He had all day to work and all night if he needed it. He was prepared to work hard. He was 22 years old and the future looked bright. Now, hopefully a lot of these illustrations remind you of stories that he's written. Okay, so here is this part at the end that I'm gonna read to you tomorrow because it's about the rest of his life. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this story, The Boy on Fairfield Street, how Ted Geisel grew up to be Dr. Seuss. I love all the little stories. Oh, my camera just flipped. I love all the little stories of how his experiences were translated into what we know as his books. All right, guys, thanks for listening.